made an API request um, and got something back, um, that object isn't type checked. But this project will help you with that. It's called TypeScript is. And here it is on NPM. Um, and yeah, there you it takes some setting up. So that's the that's the difficult bit. Um, but if you can get it set up, then I think it's not so it's quite friendly to use at runtime. So this is how you would check if this object is this type. Okay, so there you go. TypeScript is. Um, there's another thing about TypeScript, which is if you really want to use TypeScript, you have to change your JavaScript file into a TypeScript file and uh, add all these things which are not real JavaScript. Um, but Facebook's flow does it so that you can just add all these extra things in comments, which is kind of nice because uh, then your file is still a JavaScript file and people who don't use TypeScript can just use your file as normal. They don't need a compiler or anything. And there's been a long discussion on GitHub, people asking for this. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, somebody has come up with a hack that does it. Um, and um, it's he's called it plus TypeScript. So if you're interested, you can go. Oh, no, OK. If you're interested, you can go check out plus TypeScript. Uh, and that will uh, compile um, a file that has all the typing in comments rather than uh, the JavaScript file with just the types in the comments. OK, that's my JavaScript news for you. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, now we want to give a shout out to Engineers SG, who are he very helpful um, hosting us on Zoom and recording the talks for us and uploading them. Um, so go, go over to their website, go visit their website. You can also find out um, upcoming meetups on their website. Um, and if you love them, you can volunteer with them and give them a hand. Okay, um, we uh, this this meetup Singapore JS Talk JS. We have um, a couple of Telegram channels. Um, I mean, good luck typing that in. But there it is. If you want to join the channel, um, maybe I can put that in the chat later. Uh, yeah, okay, and we have a bunch of links, actually, it's pretty easy. Go to Linktree, Singapore JS, and we have a bunch of links there. If you're interested in presenting in one of our future events, uh, it won't be next month, December, we're having off, we're having a break, but in January, if you're interested in, in speaking, if you have something you want to share, then just come over to our GitHub page and um, you should see an issue for January and you can post your talk proposal on there also if you would like to volunteer to help us out if you think you can host better than me go ahead please um, uh, we have some things we're trying to improve with the repositories and the website so if you want to help with that you can um, yeah yeah uh, right I usually give a shout out to some other meetups but this page I have not have not updated, so I don't know what's actually going on this month, but um, this meetup exists, Junior Dev SG. This meetup does not exist anymore, although it's, but it kind of does. Uh, this one I went to once, that's um, Google Meetup. You could go to that one, check it on um, meetup.com. Uh, Talk CSS uh, finished last month, but their, um, their, their meeting is still on YouTube, if you want to go and watch it, or on Engineers SG. Um, and I'm imagining this is still going, React.js, so you might want to check out what they're doing. Okay, we're going to start the, top, uh, the talks very soon. Um, so get your notebook ready, because when the talk is happening, you might think of a question, but the talk is so interesting that at the end of the talk, you might have forgotten what your question is. So write it down. I'm not saying you're forgetful, but I'm, I'm forgetful. Uh, during the Q&A, if you want to ask a question, don't forget to unmute yourself in Zoom. Or if you're feeling shy, you can just type your question into the Zoom chat. and We can all see it. Uh, as I say, we're going to have short Q&A, two or three questions after each talk. And then 
we will have um, a uh, free for all at the end. Okay, so let's go into the talks. Um, Guna, are you ready to go? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, okay so Guna's going to talk to us about uh, chord trees uh, in maps using D3. Uh, over to you, Guna. Thank you. So uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, I hope. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about quad tree and its implementation on maps using D3. So let's get on with the topic. Uh, so before going into the uh, talk, let me ask a question. So this is a map. Um, I've searched for uh, some cafe and I found a lot of results. Can anyone guess the number? I'll give some time if you can try to count. Uh, guess the number of cafes. I think there's yeah. 15. 15? Okay, that's a nice guess. 16 okay, for the man. channel. Is this a trick question? Is it within this bound? Okay, oh. 13. Uh, within this bound, I'm guessing uh, uh, 265. Oh, that's a huge number. Okay. So, okay. So yeah, my name is uh, Gunasilan Narayanan. I'm a front-end developer. I work at JFrog. Uh, I go by the name Guna. You can call me Guna, that's my nickname. And these are my Twitter and GitHub IDs. You can connect with me. So uh, before going to the talk, there is one more thing I need to tell you. So uh, there is a page, jfrog.com slash show notes where you can see the slides, the slides, what I'm doing today will be uploaded there. If you want to see, you can go ahead and see there. And you can rate my talk. And the video of the talk will be uploaded there. And also, there is a raffle. So you can attend, the, fill the form. And if you win, a, uh, win the raffle, maybe you'll get a JFROC t-shirt. Uh, you'll be contacted by email. Uh, there's a QR code here, uh, code here. You can just scan it, and it will directly lead you to the site. Even if it's not up now, you'll get to see it in a bit of time. So uh, maybe you can take a picture if you want. I'll give you a few seconds. OK, so uh, let's get on with the topics then. So today we are going to see about uh, what is clustering. So let me explain what is clustering. And then we'll go into what is a quad tree. And then we'll see how we are going to implement clustering using Quatri on maps. And then we'll get on with a demo. And last, I'll tell you why I didn't use other libraries. Like there are many API libraries which provides the API for clustering, but why didn't I go with it and choose to do it on my own? So first clustering of map markers. Uh, so here's the answer. There were 22 markers. So I, I hope the 18 was the closest one we got as an answer. But I yeah, that's the, that's the whole topic. Uh, there were seven markers in, in a small place. And it, it's not easy to see because everything was up on, placed upon each other. So uh, that's why you were not able to see. That's totally fine. So let's see why we are going to implement clustering and why what's the advantage of doing clustering in a map. Uh, the first one is visual help. Obviously, uh, when you have a lot of markers in a single place, it's going to take up the or you know hide the whole uh, space. And doing clustering, what you're going to do is you're going to just group every them, every every one of them to do together, and you know place a number or something determining like okay, this, these are the number of markers there in the place. That is one thing that's going to improve. And the next one is heat maps. Yeah. So uh, you would have seen weather forecasting in news and maybe a tornado is happening. You can see uh, you know, the center spot highlighted in red color. So uh, heat maps are shown uh, by the amount of attention each area is getting. So by clustering, you will know uh, how many markers are things uh, that should be placed on a particular place. And using that, you can maybe color the particular place. So clustering helps in heat maps as well. So the last but not the least, the performance increment. 
think of some 100 to 200 markers in a particular point and if you are going to show everything that's going to occupy a lot of browser uh, memory right because uh, markers are nothing nothing but a svg node each marker will have two to three uh, nodes of svg whatever depends on the graphics that you're using for your icons and uh, that's going to occupy a lot of sp uh, space suppose you're going to have some thousand two thousand markers then it's going to impact your performance so by clustering you're going to avoid that totally so this is a google map i took a, a gif from a google map where you can see uh, in Aus australia map you can see that at first you saw only some eight mar 15 markers right but when you zoom in it's going to its perspective place respective place and uh, you can see how it is displacing. So while clustering, you'll also have to consider, uh, you know, uh, how to displace it when, uh, when you're zooming in. Because simply clustering, it won't uh, in offer you a lot because it's just going to so, uh, show uh, the amount of attention or markers in a particular place. And uh, if you're zooming in, it has to go to its respective place. Because by clustering, what you're going to do, there are two markers in a small place. You're going to uh, put it down in a single marker. In, in the middle point actually. So when you're zooming in, it's going to displace to its own place. And there you have to consider, again, you have to, uh, you know, uh, use a box to determine if two markers are again falling into the same place. So this is how we are going to do clustering. Uh, net, next, let me uh, tell you how uh, or why Quartree is used. So uh, Quartree you would have studied in your academics. It's nothing but the uh, tree data structure algorithm. So uh, you know what is a tree data structure, right? So each uh, parent node will have multiple children uh, nodes. That's how a tree data structure is. And uh, Quartree is exactly four child nodes. So each parent node will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, each parent node will be divided into four child nodes. Uh, so then each other node will be divided into four. That's how uh, a Quartree data structure uh, representation is. So consider this square as a um, whole parent node that you can see four equal child nodes and again what happens is this uh, node can be differentiated into another four uh, uh, child nodes so that's how uh, quartry works so to show quartry how it works and how the objects are formed using quartry uh, let me show you a quote an example uh, you can visit this to play with it later so here, uh, there is a plane. This is an S nothing but an SVG. And here, I'm going to show how quartry nodes are formed. So let me keep a point here, or maybe I'll put it on the corner. Let's explain it easier. OK, so there is one node now. So now I'm going to put points in each of the four boxes that we saw here. Okay? So each box has one point now. As you can see here, when I hover over it, you can see the highlighted point there. So each one has its own node now. A parent node is divided into four. So now what I'm going to do, we have each uh, four points on each of the boxes here. Now I'm going to divide this uh, box into another four uh, points. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to place another three. As you can see here, this box is again divided into another set of uh, child nodes. See here, these four come under this oh, sorry i clicked on somewhere my bad so yeah this is how uh tree uh structure for quadri works i hope this little bit explains how the nodes are formed so uh that's what i wanted to show about quadri and what is clustering then uh now let's see how we are going to implement clustering using quadri on maps so uh why I used Quartry, first of all, is D3 offers an API for Quartry. D3 is a library that, that ha it's a very vast library. You can use it for almost uh, many things, mainly for visualizations. So here uh, for map visualizations, they offer a API called Quartry. So using that API, I'm going to use them. I'm not going to uh, de device my own uh, thing because again, it's going to uh, take a lot of time. The main thing is uh, we want to cluster them. So. Yeah, so what I'm going to do, uh, the SVG points in a map is nothing but X and Y coordinates. There will be X point and Y point. It starts from 0, 0. And uh, we'll have an array of points with the uh, coordinates. 
and what i'm going to do is i'm going to send it to a d3 send it to the d3 api where it going to where it is going to uh, form uh, array based on this structure by what point i'm sending it to it. so next what i'm going to do is uh, you have to separate each uh, your map into a uh, you know a square uh, you know uh, how based on the zoom level so here i uh, you can see the image here uh, the map of usa has been uh, divided into multiple squares so the size of the square you can determine them determine them based on the zoom level i'll let, tell you how uh, why that is uh, important because now as you can see uh, the points that are falling under one uh, you know one square you are going to group them together but when you are zooming in you have to uh, you know uh, the sides of the square should be a little more smaller because when you are zooming in i'm going to zoom into part this particular part i don't want to see again the grouped one so i'm going to divide the whole map into smaller uh, squares based on that the clustering will be formed so that you will when you move in uh, there will be uh, less number of clusters forming based on the size size of the square okay so once that is done what we are going to do we are going to traverse through each of the squares and we are going to see if there are points inside the square using d3 sorry using the quadri object that we have uh, made and once that is done you will have a array with you know uh, a grouped set of uh, nodes for that you can add a uh, you know a single marker for the grouped elements maybe with a number or a color how much however you prefer so uh, this is a small code snippet here you can see a d3 uh, quadri api where we are sending the data points and what you are going to get is a quadri object the quadri object has its own attributes and it's also going to have the data points as well uh, in the structure of of the tree method three way and here what i am going to see is the cluster range the cluster range is nothing uh, but the side of size of the square so at each zoom level you are going to calculate the size of the square and that is the cluster range and based on that it's going to see uh, what you are going to do is quadri dot visit uh, attribute method so using this what you are going to do you are going to send the node the edges of the square and based on that you will you can be able to determine whether a node falls on with another node so all these uh, things will be grouped together again you can group it together and You you can calculate the center point because when you are going to group two, uh, you know you are going to group these four together. You don't want to uh, have the point any of its any of the any of the one markers place, right? You want to put it on the center of all the points. So you can calculate that as well, and using that you can create uh, you can add a marker for that place. So yeah, so let's get on with the demo. Uh, this is a JFrog uh, platform deployment. here you can see we have a dashboard and we have a topology screen where we show the map and uh, whenever a user adds a, you know another deployment to this one they can connect two or three more deployments together when they connect it you will be able to see the deployments here as you can see here i have uh, added one in mountain view one in buenos aires and i have added two in israel and i have added three in india so um, here as you can see uh, we uh, you can select the deployments and it's going to show you information like uh, the link to the deployment and the status the storage capacity and all that information will be there and uh, what else we are doing is as i said we are grouping uh, the markers together using uh, using clustering so here you can see uh, three in india so i'm going to zoom in as you can see now they are uh, you know in new delhi might be here and Ahmedabad, Mumbai might be here, but it's all shown together because they are, uh, the map is zoomed out and the places are really close by. So, uh, if it is shown at their own places, it will be overlapping. So that's why uh, uh, they are clustered. So when I zoom in, as you can see, it's getting displaced. The New Delhi icon went to its own, and Ahmedabad and Mumbai are still close together. So they are still grouped together. And when you zoom in again, it's going to again displace. So as you can see. Uh, based on the zoom level the clustering will change so here uh, the zoom level of uh, these two places sorry the distance between these two places are minimal so it was not uh, displaced even after some zoom in but it got displaced at the end so that's how clustering you have to implement clustering and when you zoom out again uh, 
when it's the distance between them is reducing, you can again uh, cluster them together. So uh, one more example I can give you is uh, of uh, Netanya and Tel Aviv. These two cities are separated just by 31 kilometers. So it's going to be very close to each other. And uh, when you're going to uh, add zoom in, probably you will set a zoom limit as well. So since the zoom uh, limit is still making the markers still close to each other, it's not getting separated. So you can consider that as well uh, when you're setting a zoom limit if you want to see. OK, so that's it about the demo. So let's see why not uh, use map APIs and like this. There are very uh, numerous map API libraries available. Those are really good actually, uh, not taking anything away from it. But why I didn't use it, let's go with that first. So these are the map APIs I considered before, uh, you know, moving on to design it on my own. Uh, Leaflet, Mapbox, Google Maps API. These are really good. Uh, I guess there's a team working behind it and obviously it's going to be maintained better than myself. So it's going to be a better option. So first thing I considered was framework granularity. So here, uh, these again leaflet and mapbox it's going to come up with its own set of uh, libraries that it's going to use and since our application is very big and we already use a lot of libraries we have to consider that as well so even if you are doing you have to consider framework uh, granularity as a you know as a thing to take up libraries that is one thing and uh, you are restricted to the apis available so here uh, all these libraries comes up with their own apis you are going to use them whichever way you want Maybe uh, you're fine with it, but uh, you will be obviously restricted. Maybe not now, but in the future, you might be restricted to use those only. You will not be able to do something on your own. Some, you know, you, your team might come up with a different uh, scenario where it has to work like this or work like that. You won't have the freedom to do that when you're using a, a library. So that is one thing. And integration with other visualizations. So uh, that is the advantage of using D3. D3 as a library can be integrated with almost any visualization library. So uh, uh, you're going to have a lot of benefits using D3 alone because it has you have the total control of it. So however you want, you can uh, redesign it. It's not going to stop you uh, from anything. So that's the main advantage you should consider as well. So yeah, so that's it for my presentation. You can ask your questions. Okay, so uh, the first question, uh, is there any particular advantages of what? Okay, uh, you are not limited to it. As I said, uh, Quartry is just a, you know, uh, algorithm that is, uh, you know, beneficial for clustering. So that is one thing. If you think uh, Hexatry is, uh, you know, even more beneficial, obviously you can try it. There is no stopping you from doing that. Maybe even if node or, you know, double link list, sorry, a single link list or double link list, that's it, we can do with it as well. It's, uh, you know, you can choose your thing, but D3 offers quad three, so that's why I chose quad three. Uh, that's one reason. I hope that answered your question. I was I, I was also thinking about the partitioning because with a quad tree where you first define the position of the grid that defines where all the lines are going to be, um, and it may be that a line cuts through the middle of a city and splits the things in that city into two. Um, I was wondering if um, yeah, and it might you it might make sense to to group all the all the things in that city in one place it might make more sense to a human to to see them all grouped together. I was wondering if um, binary partition tree might work better, but I don't really know. Because um, I think that could sort of draw the line anywhere, but it would put half the things on one side and half on the other. So it would keep close things always together. I'm not really sure about that, though. Yeah, that's a... 
Maybe, yeah, but uh, the thing why Quatri, uh, I guess, was uh, more helpful here uh, probably is the way it searches uh, everything. So uh, maybe, uh, yeah, binary uh, search yeah, offers a better way, but uh, maybe I should, yeah, I can take a look at it. Quatri is more suitable for, uh, you know, a plane. Uh, Quatri, uh, you know, offers better uh, search algorithm when it comes to uh, partition of partition of space and time. So uh, that's an open question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions? Anyone want to ask? Anyone? Oh, there's the T-shirts. If you want a T-shirt, is that a superhero frog? Uh, yeah, so we have a superhero frog for each year. So this year it is Iron Frog. So the year of Iron Man. Okay, and what did what did J Frog do? Um, okay, so J Frog offers the product called Artifactory for uh, DevOps end-to-end. -end, uh, We have a lot of other products as well. We used to have Artifactory as a separate product and offer other products for uh, customers. But now we have a platform called JFrog platform where we have all the products together. So Artifactory is one among it. We have distribution, we have pipelines, CI CD pipelines offered through JFrog itself. And we have a uh, dashboard, which is called Mission Control, which offers the view of all the topologies. And you can even have a look at the trends, the usage of what, whatever is used and all that, a lot of graphs available. Okay, interesting. Okay, if anyone uh, has any more questions, maybe they can save them till the end when we have the open mic. Thank you very much for your talk, Guna. Uh, yeah. Let's go on to Ten's talk, um, a note on the browser. Ten, are you ready to go? Yep. Uh, let okay. me share my screen. Okay. Take it um, away. Yeah. Uh, sorry for my messy desktop. If that triggers anyone. Uh, okay. How do I? Where is the present button? Uh, there you go. Okay. So um yeah hi I'm I'm ten I'm I'm ten Z um. So my name is Ten Tzu Yang and ZY is kind of my initials. So that's why people call me Ten Z. And today uh, I did change the name of my talk last minute. So sorry about that. It's uh, the sounds of JS and instead of a, a note on a browser because uh, I wanted to use this graphic. Uh, so sound of music, sound of JS. So, so uh, in our science class, we learned that uh, music is kind of like um, vibrations that are sent through some medium. And uh, in this case, uh, when we hear it, it's usually the air to our eardrums, right? And these vibrations in our eardrums are then converted into electrical pulses and sent through our nerves. So this is like the visualization of how the vibration uh, looks like in, in, uh, when, when it hits the air particles, air, uh, air molecules. Um, and this, but this is not particularly useful for analysis. So usually we represent them in the form of a wave like this, right? So, um, um, the musical note is just the same as any other sound, but vibrating consistently-ish at uh, certain frequencies. So um, the Web Audio API uh, can make use of certain mathematical functions, or it just takes in a, a, a audio source and whatever to, to, to play anything related to sound. But uh, I also found out that it's not very easy to use without some kind of background in signal processing. And uh, yeah, so when, when you want to work with the web audio playground, you usually work with uh, uh, this uh, context. Uh, our operations will revolve around the audio context. And um, so this uh, web audio playground, is, um, it isn't built by me, so, uh, so just, just to put it out there, um, it allows you to kind of visualize uh, what it does to your sound. You can add an analyzer, you can, you can build it in a graph like this. Um, and you can see that um, Web Audio API can have multiple input sources. Uh, it can 
it, it's represented by a graph. It, it can have multiple nodes that it connects to. Uh, in this particular example, uh, or in this particular program, it only outputs to one uh, output, but you can actually output it to, to multiple sounds to do things like uh, surround sound 6.1, uh, or, or four channel, two channel, and mono. So um, here are four ways to play sounds and uh, I've built it in a very uh, small compact, um, or the, the, the simplest like vanilla JS implementation of, of playing sounds on the browser. Um, so here I'll, I, might, I will start playing uh, some audio sounds for my example. So if it's a bit loud, uh, please, uh, you may want to turn down your volume. So um, this first one is um, playing audio using uh, uh, audio elements. Uh, so I chose a file upload because it's just easier to practice with. Um, so let me see. I should have a. This thing's in the way. Uh, okay, never mind. I can't find. I can't find the file that I was looking for. Is it in the desktop? Yeah, here. That was really really loud, but uh, so um, so basically, is is as I said, uh, you create some, you get some audio elements, you you change the source, you load it, and then you play it. Um, but you need to you need to connect. Where was the and uh, let's see. Yeah, so I'm connecting the audio source to the analyzer and then the analyzer to the destination, which is our speaker. And uh, so the analyzer is the thing that shows the, the, the bars moving up and down. So that's one way of playing. And the next way of playing, we have um, this one, I believe is audio buffer. So, um, right. So previously, uh, the, the audio element is one of the easier ways to, to handle audio because it, it, it just gives us a nice um, HTML element that we can call at a source and then just play from there. Uh, but if we want to be a bit more fancy, we can do things like uh, um, adding uh, audio buffer. So audio buffer is really, really good to, to, to play short clips of music uh, because it's stored directly on memory and playing the short clips of music multiple times or in a loop. Uh, this is particularly useful for that. Um, I'm not going to do the example because it's too loud and there's no volume control on this example, but you can kind of see um, you would uh, you would actually need to start choose to start at a particular time um, a value and and there are some uh, finicking to do to, to get this audio buffer things to work. So the next way, which is um, uh, this is using the microphone. Um, so I do believe this example should be yeah yeah. So now there's a double, there'll be a double voice, double, double voice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so this one is a uh, pretty, also pretty simple. Uh, I think the get user media has changed a few times over the past uh, couple, the past year or so. So this might be a bit different by the time uh, you might want to play around with this. Um, but this basically takes in the audio input uh, because I've, run this example on my computer before I've already given permission. So anytime a, a, a website requires your voice or your, your speaker, it will usually ask for permission in the, uh, your browser will ask for permission. So this doesn't happen in this example because I've, I've tested it before. And uh, finally, the last one, which is um, um, a huge part of my talk is the, the oscillator. So the thing about the oscillator is you pass a mathematical function in, um, in this way, um, yeah. You pass a mathematical function in, and that will affect the, the kind of sound that you're playing. And also, uh, the other thing is you can change the frequency and things like that. So this is also really, really loud, so I won't play it. But uh, yeah, this is the, the basic example. So with the oscillator, right, I wanted to create my own synthesizer. and this. So, so how do I get to play musical notes from numbers? So um, uh, after some research, I found that uh, Generally, the musical notes are usually uh, represented by hertz, right? And that's uh, how, that's basically uh, for each of a wave, a type of wave, uh, how many times uh, does this wave appear? Uh, let me check if 
I'm saying nonsense here. Uh, no, I didn't write it down. But basically, um, it's, it kind of represents how many times this wave happens in a short sp in a, in a span of time. So uh, 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 A4, which is the most, um, A4 is generally a, a kind of useful root node that a lot of people use to base their, 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 app, their apps or whatever uh, when they want to, to, to do, to represent, um, when they want to have some um, mathematical function involving music, they'll start from an A4, which is uh, 440 hertz. And uh, one, thing, one thing about the music notes in general is that uh, this, there are actually 12 notes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, notes in Western music. Uh, uh, interestingly, this is actually uh, mostly cultural. So there could be some uh, other cultures in different musics that have uh, different uh, gaps between the, the notes and what sounds in tune and what sounds out of tune. But uh, Western music is generally accepted the 12 equal temperament. But uh, one thing that is not cultural is that two notes uh, of double, uh, one that is double or, or half the frequency will sound the same. So this is what we call consider uh, the same, same note in a different octave. But this, this is because the wavelength happens to be in sync with each other at uh, every, alternate, um, every alternate phase. So uh, one way that we can use to calculate this is uh, we given some root node value, and then we get um, so we we get a predefined root node, and then uh, n is the nth node from the root node, and then to figure out the constant a, uh, we will we will just use this formula basically to, to go and calculate. So uh, there's some math behind when you want to do some uh, musical notes. Yeah. So uh, I believe I believe yeah. So you should be able to extract out the, uh, uh, simplify it and get some constant. And this is, this is how I got this thing. And this gives me a way to, to separate the oscillator into different nodes. And yeah, and then I will set the node at a certain time when it's playing. So it will change, it will change the node halfway through. If let's say you, change, you call this function uh, halfway, it will change the frequency of the, uh, you change the frequency of the, the wave and then play a different note. So uh, this gives me this, uh, which is actually built by me. Uh, so this is going to be a bit loud. Uh, so the Otama phone is based off this uh, musical instrument synthesizer called Otama Tone. Otama Tone. And it looks like this. Uh, you might have seen it before. It makes this really, really uh, weird, kind of saxophony kind of sound. And uh, the thing about the Otama Tone that is so uh, interesting to me is that uh, with a uh, with a uh, ukulele or guitar, you kind of have frets that determine like you can play this note and you can play this note. There is no kind of microtonal in between kind of things. Uh, with a violin, you can actually achieve microtonal. So, so you can do like vibrato, right? But uh, in a violin, you can do vibrato just by sliding up and down. So that's a different technique. And so, so the automaton can do that. So I tried to emulate that. So this is the, I think this is A, I think A4 is somewhere. And you can do the, the vibrato kind of deal. Um, so you can change the different sound waves. And uh, I, I've added another thing here for constant. Uh, so this is like kind of like auto-tune, I guess. So to sure that you start on the correct note, right? And then this is to consistently keep it in tune. Yeah, so there's no microtonal anymore when, when, when you flick that. So that's uh, all that math goes into this example. But uh, one thing that I realized was uh, the sound that we heard was actually the, the, is a sine wave, which is, you know, that, that basic mathematical wave that we, we play around a lot. So um, I was trying to get a... Uh, how to sound more like the actual musical instrument, right? Not just a sine wave. And one thing I found out was that uh, you can actually kind of build any wave that you want out of multiple sine waves. And um, so, so, so uh, all waves are, are sinusoidal, or at least it should be sinusoidal. That's what we are assuming. And you can approximate it with some kind of a combination of waves. And 
and uh, you can do anything you want, like the, the picture of Bart Simpson over here. So MP3 file format actually does exactly this. It chops a song into millions of sections and determine important frequency components. It junk those that are unimportant until it's done. What's left is you know, our most important frequencies and then it plays into our, ear, our ears to represent the original track. Uh, yeah, so, so to achieve this is uh, called a Fourier, uh, we, we use something to do a Fourier transform to, to get the, the fr from a given wave, we will convert it into some uh, sine waves. Um, but now I want to do it the other way around. I want to do a reverse Fourier, if, if you will. So uh, there's, a, there's this um, function that is provided by the Web Audio API. We can set the periodic wave and uh, this gives us a Fourier this gives us two inputs, uh, real, real and image. Uh, this actually is the Fourier, I don't think it's mentioned here. Yeah, I don't think it's mentioned here. But basically this, these values are called the Fourier coefficients when you want to construct a wave. And um, yeah, so how do we get the Fourier coefficients? So um, uh, using this particular thing, uh, this huge chunk of math we, we can get some kind of, uh, you, given a Fourier, uh, given a Fourier series, I can visualize the wave and then I can try and emulate the kind of sound that it comes with. So this gives me this kind of deal. So I can add the coefficients, right? And then I can play the waves a bit and it will kind of affect the thing. So the, the sound is quite different from the sine wave that we heard just now. And uh, this gives us the ability. So, so one thing that I can do, uh, test, test instrument. So this, this tool gives me something that I can save the, the, the Fourier coefficient. And then going back to the Otama phone, we can actually load the Fourier coefficients that we save. It should be in downloads, right? Yeah, it's over here. So it's just in a JSON file. And then now you can, oops, that's a bit loud. Turn down one octave. So that's the sound now. So uh, just by playing around with these numbers, I can, I can actually get an uh, automaton kind of sound. And then uh, now that, that particular uh, Fourier coefficient is safe in this uh, preset over here, this automaton preset. So this is kind of close to the actual automaton. Now, uh, so that's uh, about the playing sounds. So now we have, uh, now that we managed to get the notes from numbers, maybe we want to analyze the, the, the numbers from notes. Right, so just now in the example, when I was playing the video, you saw that there was the waves. So that's as simple as just connecting the analyzer. The analyzer gives us a series of, gives us a, a array of numbers. Uh, you can choose your size to fast Fourier transform. So this is back to the same thing. We are using Fourier transform. And then uh, gives you kind of like the, the, the peak of the, 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 the sound. So you can, you can use this to, to build up, you know, the, when you have an equalizer with the, the sounds coming with the bars and all that. There is another function, um, let's see, in this analyzer, analyzer. There, there is another, let me see, analyzer, analyzer. Yeah, so this one, I'm getting the byte frequency data. There's a get byte time frequency data, if I'm not wrong. Um, that one allows you to build the sound waves that you can see in a different kind of visualizations. Right. Um, so this is another thing that uh, I built. Um, well, this, this was built using my code and uh, some other code that I found online. So this initially started as a tuner and uh, it uses uh, some mathematics to kind of identify, identify oh, oh, double, okay, double sound. sound. Uh, uh, let me mute that first. Um, so so this, this kind of like identifies the, the note that you are playing by, by, by taking the raw audio input and then uh, converting it into a wave that does some mathematics on it and it finds what's the notes that's being played. So this, uh, when I was learning the guitar, I was practicing scales and uh, I don't have a guitar on me now, but uh, so I'll just show an example. Um, and let's have the C major scale. scale. Okay. So that was a bit too, uh, I played the D note a bit too fast, but basically wherever note that you're playing, it, it turns green uh, just by detecting which note is being played. So, uh, and then the last thing that I, I found was uh, this code that actually detects chords, which is in very, very interesting. So, um, so it, it, it is, the, the, another very interesting thing about this, this uh, uh, library that I was using is that it, it is in C++ and it's actually using those, uh, the, the, 
the fancy smancy uh, web assembly uh, to, to uh, expose its API to JS. So I think, I think it's, it's, if you want to find it, it's just as simple as just Googling a core or detect, detect the JS. Yeah. Let's say I Googled it before, and it's this, this particular one. So it's just JavaScript bindings for, for uh, code detection. Uh, this builds a chromogram, a chromogram which is a, a representation of each node. And then uh, it gives it a certain value. So you can start. I don't think this, yeah, okay. So this one doesn't. Oh, another thing that I did was I read a web speech API. So you can see that my speech is being transcripted, uh, although not very correctly. And then it can detect the chords. This is uh, supposed to be a F, F major. Okay, it doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work when I'm giving an example. Okay, let's try a C major. Of course it doesn't work now. What? Okay, never mind then. So um, I guess I can try to sing. Um, a long, long time ago, there was a volcano all alone in the middle of the sea. But yeah, so basically, you know, you can play around with that just based on um, the, the chord, the notes that's being detected and then web, uh, and then of course with speech API, you can do transcription. Uh, this doesn't work as well as I hope because uh, playing the, the song while singing is a bit, um, it will disrupt the algorithm a bit. So it doesn't really give you back the same chord, even though my demonstration was bad. Um, but uh, we can do things like split up, you know, can play the chord now and then say the lyrics, play the chord now, say the lyrics, and you can create a tablature of music uh, very easily. So that's my last example for today. And um, uh, so now to plug my things, um, everything that I've spoken here, I've gone more in depth on, on uh, in three blog posts over a period of time. So I started in last year, November, uh, which is the synthesizer thing. And then uh, the slides here are on my, uh, everything you can just go TZY INC. So that's my initials, then Ziyang, and then just INC. Uh, yeah, so slides and examples are there. Uh, follow my Twitter if you find uh, this kind of things interesting because I think I'll be doing music and JS kind of things for a while. And that's all for my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tenzi. Very interesting. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know a lot about music. So like, what, what, is, an, what is an oscillator? Uh, uh, oscillator is basically a thing that uh, uh, goes up and down, like oscillate. So, you know, so it vibrates at a certain thing. So uh, when you create oscillator, it's basically creating something that, that creates that wave thing. And then you pass the wave into the audio context and that's how you make the sound. So this is not really a, a music. I don't think it's a music term. I think it's just a mathematical uh, term. Uh, I see, okay. I guess uh, no more questions. Thank you for sharing all the links as well. That gives us lots of reading and stuff we can play around with. Well, uh, if you have any more questions, if you think of any questions later on, you can keep them for the end. Or even uh, take them onto Twitter in the coming days. OK, thanks very much, Tenzi. I think we will move on then. Um, Murray is going to talk to us about, oh, hold on a sec. Ah, um, performance, achieving page, page speed with a data heavy data visualization. Okay, Murray, uh, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready to go. Okay, over to you. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you fine, yes, all good. Okay. Okay, you should be able to see me. 
Yeah, we can see Fine. your slide. <clears throat> okay, hi everybody. Thank you so much for the first two talks. I very much enjoyed both of them a lot. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, an experience I had and what I, what I did to try and actually fix it. And it's all about page speed and, uh, and about Tableau. So uh, some background, I, I, uh, Tableau Public actually sends out data visualizations every day and I, I look at most of them and I come across some really good ones, but I don't dare share any of them because they're, the output is really pretty awful. And so I'm going to demonstrate now what that actually is, what that actually looks like. Can everybody see me? I can see Joey on the video. Can anyone see me? Yes, I can see you in the corner of the screen and your slides are thinning the screen. So okay. it's all good? All good. Just I don't want to look at you. So I see anything. Don't know why I can't see myself. Never mind. Uh, I'm not saying anything about you, Joey. I mean, it's just wonderful. Anyway, so, okay, I'm going to give a commentary as this loads. So... Uh, it's trying to load. Uh, we see a little bit of text. It disappears. It's still trying to load. We see a whiteout. Uh, I try and actually scroll a bit. I can't do any kind of input. Nothing is happening as I'm trying to scroll. Ah, finally, I can scroll. So this is a Tableau public uh, kind of output, and uh, it, it's got lots of problems. Apart from the fact that it took forever to load, uh, I, I'll try and do this. I'll just click on a, on a slide because I think something's going to happen. And we get another whiteout and we get uh, a spinner going and nothing seems to be happening. And uh, I give up. And then I do a bit of mouse over and sometimes those pop-ups appear and oftentimes they do not. So uh, now I can't I can't send this to my friend who I know is going to be uh, looking at it on their phone because it's just a disaster on a phone and a couple of other things that's actually going on. Clearly, I'm not getting all of, uh, um, all of this particular uh, country because there's some stuff missing out the end and uh, I'm, I'm missing stuff here. I don't know what's going on. So to explain, this part here is an iframe. So we've got an iframe which does not take up the entire screen and I, I can't see the, the whole thing. The only way I can scroll to the right is I have to go right down the bottom, find the scroll bar, scroll to the right, go all the way back up again so I can actually uh, do something and, and see what's going on. So what you can do with this is you can click on any of these things and it will actually sort it by... Um, by that particular fuel and let's try that so let's do coal <clears throat> once again it takes forever spinners appear we get a white out on the screen i can't scroll i can't do anything uh, after a long long time finally we get uh, we get some action now i forget what these country names are over here so i've got to go right down the bottom again and i have got to scroll left using the horizontal scrolly thing. By the way, this is the text that we saw at the beginning, which jumped down and then we couldn't see where it actually went. And then here are the countries and showing um, whatever I sorted on coal. So it's a bit of a disaster. So let's go back and, and see why. It's slow, it's bloated, <clears throat> it's clunky, as you saw. Uh, it uses an iframe and my question is why? I mean, there's only a very few applications that should use iframes, I think, uh, and this is not one of them. <clears throat> so I don't even know why they're using iframe. It uses one huge background image and the whole thing is 1500 pixels wide, which is not mobile friendly. And as you saw, it's not even desktop friendly. Uh, it's, it's just pretty awful. So uh, now, if you haven't heard of Tableau before, just very quickly, it's a very popular data visualization tool. It's very um, versatile. There's many different chart types like pyramids and um, scatter plots and maps and a whole pile of different things. So uh, I understand why it's popular. Uh, you can do a lot with it. It allows filtering, it allows sliders and all sorts of things. 
uh, and it does handle huge data sets. But the output is just so awful. Why has such a popular tool got such awful output? So we let, uh, I, I ran it through Google PageSpeed to see what it actually said. Its score was a measly 11. If, if any of your sites are getting 11 on Google PageSpeed, please throw the whole lot out and start again because um, Google's going to reject it <laughs> very much. Even on a desktop, uh, it, it gets a score of 43, so it's, it's actually quite slow. Um, it's bloated. The bandwidth is uh, actually it's more than that. It's actually 7.7 7 something. I'll explain why I've got 5.6 in a minute. Um, there's at least a megabyte of unused JavaScript that, that comes down the pipe, which is part of the, uh, the, the time that it needs to, to load. It's clunky as we saw. It has whiteouts like I showed you. Uh, it ignores user interaction. So sometimes you're trying to do something and you click or do something and it just it doesn't seem to do anything. So pretty awful. Um, I did an analysis in uh, web page test, which I think is this one. I'll just open it again. Okay. So uh, ugly. Um, these are actually surprisingly not too bad, but this is starting to show something pretty serious. It's um, <clears throat> 21 seconds to fully loaded, uh, 15 seconds to document complete, 108 requests to that point, 116 requests to this point. And the waterfall, my God, the waterfall. So uh, it loads, it loads a whole bunch of JavaScript, it loads a bunch of uh, fonts, then it loads a whole bunch more JavaScript and some SVGs and then a bunch more JavaScript and a bunch more JavaScript, then a bunch more JavaScript. By the way, what you're looking at is the analysis of the iframe parent, that is the outer border. We haven't even got to the actual visualisation yet. Something, I don't know what, takes seven seconds to actually come in, a whole lot more stuff. Finally, at this point, this is where the, the images start coming in for the actual visualisation. So this is the 22 second, uh, 15 second in this case, but I've seen it but, um, out at 22, 24 seconds to actually come to here. So all of this stuff was all of when I was talking and pointing out whiteouts and spinners and all sorts of things. So all these images come in <clears throat> and then guess what? A bunch more fonts and a bit more JavaScript and some more JavaScript. So after 116 <clears throat> calls to the server, finally the whole thing's actually in. <clears throat> there are actually 36 different uh, domains that are actually called during the, the load of that page. So no wonder it is slow, no wonder it is clunky, and no wonder from a user point of view, it's, it's pretty awful. So I just said all that stuff, 116 requests, 36 different domains, um, and I just showed you those. Okay, so I couldn't stand it, and I thought, well, I better, I better go build my own and see if I can do uh, something a little faster. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you're about to see uses the same data, the same amount of data. I just got, I used the same data source uh, as that one did. Um, I'm, I produce similar outputs, uh, not exactly the same thing, so I didn't want to do actually the same thing, but it's, it's fairly similar, as you'll see. So I will not have time to actually uh, give a commentary while it loads because it's loaded. So 22 seconds down to less than one second is what you just saw. Um, this is all the same kind of information, but as I said, I didn't want to... I didn't want to load it the same way. Um, and when I mouse over, I've got, I've got the data that's coming up, which is typical of these sorts of visualizations. So if I, if I scroll down a bit quicker, you'll see what I'm actually up to here. I'm lazy, lazy loading all of these. And so the only thing that actually loads at the beginning is about up to that much, and then all of the rest of it uh, loads later. Now, similar to the Tableau one that you saw, you can, you can sort by various things. You can sort by oil, and it shows up an interesting thing. Um, 
Uh, America uses tons of oil, as you'd expect. China is the second most highest uh, oil um, consumer, but it's it's using way more coal. Just the interesting thing is China is still building coal-fired power plants and has been um, at least one a year for the last 10 years or so. But as you see, it's actually not using them. So they're like bridges to nowhere. They're, they're building all these power plants, but nothing's happening. Unlike India, which is building power plants and using them and choking all the people of Delhi who can't even see the next block. I know I've been there in the middle of it. Um, and I'm going to... OK, so, so all of these, uh, we sort and it comes in super quick, we sort and it comes in super quick, and so on. OK, so I'll go to the other one, which, which I find more interesting. These are total energy consumption, by the way. I just loaded it in less than a second. Um, and these are now totals. And I'll show an interesting one. Well, I think it's interesting. For uh, countries that use a large percentage of their, their consumption being oil, are uh, these ones. Cyprus is the top, 95%. Good old Singapore is 86%. Um, Luxembourg, 77 and so on. What's interesting is that these are all small countries. Cyprus, Singapore, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, Sri Lanka um, are all small. Iraq, of course, produces tonnes of it, so, of course, they're going to use tonnes of it. Now, some interesting things here. Did you realise that Singapore is actually uses coal, 0.74% of its of its uh, energy consumption is coal. They actually built that coal-fired power plant in 2013. So the world is moving away from coal and Singapore decides to start building one uh, at that time. You probably didn't know that, that Singapore actually has geothermal um, uh, power. Uh, I live in Sembawang and the Sembawang hot spring is just down the road. And uh, yeah, there's heaps of power coming up, uh, heaps of energy coming up from that. Anyway, this is not a not a uh, talk about energy. But I found this really interesting to do. There's lots of really interesting things to see. Um, I'll just do one or two others. Hydro is really interesting. Norway is great. Huge amount of hydro that they actually do. Iceland's also good. 24% geo, 54% hydro, and only tiny bits of coal and, and oil. Okay, so I think anything like this should be quick. I should be able to just click and it should be there. I shouldn't have to wait 22 seconds uh, for the whole thing to load and to come in. Okay, so uh, I showed you both of those. So I'm using SVG for the charts. And what I do is I create those on the server and I cache them so that uh, they can come in really quickly. Uh, I, I load just a certain number on page load and the rest are retrieved via Ajax on scroll. Now, a key thing about uh, quick page loading is to only load what you really need for the user to see at the top of the page. Any stuff underneath the, uh, underneath the first screenful is, is not worth loading. If you can load it later, load it later. Um, uh, I, I also do the same thing with what I call data blobs to do those mouse overs and to get the, uh, the data coming in for individual years, uh, I need to actually import the data for each one. So <clears throat> I create those blobs on the server using PHP uh, and then on page load, I bring in five and then the rest are retrieved via Ajax. So each one of those is taking about one second or so as I scroll down the page. So the data blobs are just things like this with a country array for each country uh, that's going to appear and um, some board properties because things like the, uh, the Y max and Y min are different for each one because they're using different amounts of uh, each fuel for each one. Um, and basically that's that. <clears throat> um, I'm using Cloudflare, Cloudflare CDN, the free version, and I cache everything. So everything is super quick because uh, it's cached, of course, in Singapore, and so it comes in uh, really quickly. The only country where Cloudflare is not so successful is actually Australia. For reasons known only to them, they have some sort of dispute with Cloudflare. So if you're in Australia, you actually get the, um, the downloads actually come from the Singapore server most of the time. Um, 
I'm only actually using one domain, which I'll show you in a minute, yet I'm using Google Analytics on the page and I'm using SVG, uh, an SVG library, but it's a PHP library, so I don't have to do anything with, uh, with JavaScript in that case. So let's look at the speed of the improved version. Uh, Google PageSpeed tells me 99, it's not perfect, but it's close. And uh, for desktop, 100. Um, on the web page test, uh, well, there's not much to show, but I'll just go to it. Um, all A's, which is what I was looking for. The whole thing complete, document complete in one second, fully loaded 1.69, that's after my first few things come in. Uh, the waterfall, your waterfall should be really, really um, um, not high. If you've got a whole lot of things in your waterfall, then if you want a fast page, you've got to do something about it. So all I'm doing is I'm pulling in my page where all of the JavaScript I need is actually embedded in the page. <clears throat> Pardon me. Every time you do a, a call to some other domain for the, uh, for the various libraries and things that you need, each one of those takes up time. And so if everything that you need is actually embedded in the page, it's super quick. I have one font that I, I use. I have that font on my own server. I don't call it from uh, Google or anywhere. Um, <clears throat> then this is uh, this is actually the um, pulling in the first bunch of uh, charts that I do on an initial page load, my favicon, and then here's Google Analytics firing uh, to follow what everybody's doing on the page. <clears throat> so the connection view is just two domains only. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So I uh, showed you all that. So the bandwidth, the initial page load is only, only 100 kilobytes, not whatever I said before. Um, it's about 7.9 uh, megabytes, the, the Tableau version that I showed you before on initial page load. Way too much. No, no phone, ever, phone user ever wants to sit around waiting for that much to actually come in. Um, 3.1 megabyte in total, that's once you get to the bottom of the page, that's all of the, the bits and pieces that have actually come in uh, for the whole page. Um, I'm using minimal JS library and anything that I am using is inside the page. So my summary for fast pages, keep it simple, keep it lean, avoid unnecessary JavaScript bloat, and there's way too much of that on the web these days. Uh, reduced domain calls. And uh, caching everything makes a huge difference. Yeah. So achieving speed with a data heavy page can be done. I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Murray. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions for Murray? Or any, um, any of your own stories with um, optimizing web pages? While you were talking, I looked up the, um, the seven second download uh, from Crazy Egg, and apparently Crazy Egg is a an optimization tool, believe it or not, website optimization, heat maps, and A/B testing. Yes, it is, and that's a good example of something that does not need to be there on every page. You actually put up something like that when you first publish the page, so that you can see where people are getting stuck with the with the UI or, or whatever is actually happening, and then you 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 take it off. I bet there is nobody in, in the whole um, Tableau public hierarchy that ever looks at that. It's just a, a, a slow bit of slow loading piece of JavaScript that they could really do with that. Mm -hmm. Or something like that, you could just load for one in 20 users, so it doesn't affect everybody, but you're still getting some data. Right. Yep. Here's, here's an interesting thought for you. Uh, when Gmail changed about five or six years ago, probably more, can't remember, 
but it used to be Gmail used to load like that. I mean, it's only just a bunch of text. It should load like that. But next time you open Gmail, have a look how long it actually takes to load. It's often 10 to 15 seconds to actually load just a little bit of text. It drives me nuts. Yeah, that bothers me too. I think they, it might have got a little bit faster recently, actually, when their logo changed. It seems it seems to load a bit faster as well. I'm not seeing the loading bar anymore. Uh, yeah, but it's not plain HTML. It is still loading a, uh, uh, I guess we'd call it a single page app, a JavaScript driven app. I did used to use the plain HTML version because of, um, like you're saying, the uh, the main app is can be quite slow yeah, to I've, load up. I've been known to use that as well <laughs> on occasion. It's just just crazy. So what I expected people to say at this point is, yes, but my, bo my boss says I've got to have this and I've got, to, I've got to track that and I've got to have this and whatever, so I cannot do. Um, one of the things, what, what's actually really interesting for me now is that I, I sold my website uh, about six months ago. And with my own website, I had lots of analytics going on. I had lots of all sorts of things actually happening. And it's actually really liberating to, to build websites from scratch and say, well, I don't actually need that. That's not really necessary. I don't need all that rubbish uh, and, and just have the bare minimum. And it, it's actually really quite nice. It's nice to go back to basics. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess one thing I'd... Uh, say is um, there's a there is a movement within the JavaScript community of uh, what they call it statically generated uh, websites which is um, and also the server rendering which is trying to um, but the statically generated is um, you, you might use react to create uh, how everything looks but actually you'll render it ahead of time into static files on the web server and when people load your page, it's just loading up those static files. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of as, people using that. as long as that's actually what's happening. I have played a bit with that myself, but actually a whole pile of JavaScript, the ones I've tried out, a whole pile of JavaScript loads first, and then you get your pages which are downloading from the server. And I kind of think, no, why not just load the text and stuff from the server directly? But yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, and I think that, that sounds good. Okay, well, thanks very much, Murray. Um, if anybody has any questions in future, where can they find you? On Twitter? Yeah, I, I had my Twitter handle in the in the okay. last thing. I shall put it. I shall put it in the chat. Great. So, yeah, so thanks to all the speakers. Um, and now we sort of have an open mic time. Um, and you can, you can talk about whatever you like. Um, if you have an announcement, if you're, if you're looking to hire someone, if you want to be hired, uh, if you found something cool you want to share, if you have some problem with your work that you want to um, maybe get some um, input on. Uh, yeah, so... It's just a free chat now. Uh, so everybody go ahead. After that audio talk, I'm going to share something a little bit fun which is plink.in, which you may have seen before because it's not so new. Um, uh, yeah, I've put it in the chat. So it's a kind of, it's a music making thing. Uh, yeah. You should have started with this link. <laughs> okay, but then uh, we we would have missed out on Tenzi's musical. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. 
Essence before his ukulele is ready. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. There seems to be a problem with their servers. So there is no plink in at the moment. Well, there's, uh, there's the intro. No, I'm oh, in. Shame. No, my name is Dan Ferret, if anyone is there. Oh, you got in? Yeah, yeah I got in as well. With Shadow Bear. Oh, Shadow Bear is Eric, I guess. You rest an hour. Oh, I got kicked out. You got kicked out? <laughs> okay, okay. Maybe we shouldn't be distracted uh, by Plink. Oh, Mari's posted some links about uh, music and transformation geometry. Yeah, we'll find it. If you guys want to do open mic, you can just unmute this stuff. But I guess there probably isn't much announcement for today then. Do you want to ask the questions, Joey? Uh, what what questions? Issue. You mean um, with our GitHub? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean now. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple of questions for... Um, our attendees, um, which is, um, do you prefer we have two talks in a session or do you prefer we have three talks in a session? No answer. You can unmute your mics because all your mics are muted. Murray likes three short ones. Uh, but uh, yeah, may I ask why why you prefer that? Um, some people can be a little long-winded and uh, <laughs> people are usually too polite to say, uh, your time's up. So usually, usually if you're trying to squash three in, the problem with that is that, yeah, I mean, it can, it can end up uh, going quite late if everybody still wants to present everything. So I, I actually think it's fine. Somebody might come along and say, look, I really need half an hour to, to, uh, to do this properly. Well, you know, occasionally fine. It means mm. you don't have to find as many, many speakers if you've only got two, that's for sure. Mm. Or maybe we, maybe it should depend on what the what the speaker thinks they need, and that can uh, influence mm. our decision. Yeah, I think um, I gave a talk a few months back, and I think I overran, uh, and I failed to interrupt myself and tell myself to stop because my time was <laughs> running out. But today's timing was really good. Um... Today's format? Yeah, today's timing was good. Okay. You mean the length of the durations of uh, the thoughts, right? Mm, yes. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just thinking with the closing of the year for, for today and for next year, what are we expecting? Like, is, is top format still working for you guys on a virtual? Uh, manner is there anything that's missing that you're missing from real life interactions or things like this uh, feel free to rent or anything as well 
we just want to know if like the virtual formats are working because quite a lot of meetups have actually stopped. Mm. Yeah, is it still nice that there's meetups available virtually? I think it's better than none, but it's just, I don't know, I just feel awkward like <laughs> speaking in, in, in a big group and it's like virtual. I don't know, it's just something not natural about it, I suppose. Because uh, it's too much scrutiny, or oh, no, not not that. Oh, but I don't know. I I imagine it would be quite nice if you can have like um so, some form of like a uh, offsite like five people, kind of virtual. Oh. Just, you know, then then we can I don't know be in small groups, but somehow still connected via like virtual, and you can get to know like yeah. I, I guess like live interactions always always trumps like this kind of you know virtual stuff. Yeah. But uh, I think the, the format is great, though. I mean, I still enjoy it a lot and listening to the different things that uh, the speakers shared today. That was great. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I'll give a thumbs up. Yeah, actually, that'd be pretty nice if there's a big space and we can split the tables of five. <laughs> yeah. Anybody yeah. wants to volunteer your thing? <laughs> I think you're not allowed to go to the meeting. So. Now I'm thinking the of restaurant. the tutorial room. Uh, yeah, they have yeah, like table of sticks. Yeah. And it's Very perfectly Christ, space. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Just one, feel like, rather eight. like have a... Uh, if let's say groups are... It can also be like uh, distributed, really distributed. It's not necessary that everyone have be like in the same uh, venue. Then can use a similar like this zoom format then like to come uh link out all the groups together so like a, f a few different groups watching all the same zoom uh, uh meeting like virtual breakout rooms it's not really say breakout rooms but i rather say that the the groups can can be uh, in one venue, then another group in another venue, and everyone like join in the same zone. Like all the groups are like, joined together in the same zoom. I get it. It's like a watch party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's kind of cute. Exactly, yeah. But then everyone needs to turn up. <laughs> you wouldn't have to travel so far. You could go to your local watch party. Oh wow, that'd be pretty sweet. That, that might be possible in, in, in phase three because there's uh, eight people per group, right? Yeah, just be into two, right? Yeah, or two or I three. That's quite cute. Mm. Okay. But I thought not necessarily two or three group survivors, but somehow it can, can scale it upwards. Mm. That way, during your, your break, breakout sessions, it's definitely like you, you don't need a like, Zoom. Then when you come together, then you use the Zoom. Okay. okay, I have nothing to say or anything besides uh, have a good end to the 2020. Anybody else? I guess uh, since this is the last one in uh, training for like carry this on have, and having me in the organizing team as well. Yeah. And I uh, just want to say thanks to uh, engineers.ng for helping us throughout the year and all the attendees. Mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah, it's, it's quite tough for the attendees to even just show up because it's so easy to, to just build on us, right? So, and you guys are still show up, so that's great. So yeah, we really appreciate it. Uh, but if you have any feedback on the format, just feel free to pop onto the Telegram group and then like post your comments or right, um, like things you prefer. Or if you saw some formats from other meetups, maybe in other countries or whatever, since it's all virtual now, then uh, feel free to just like suggest. Uh, we're very open to this kind of things. Totally cool. And also, if you want to help out or like do stuff, like please also ping us on the Telegram group. It's not like a really, it's not a group for chatting like Dev SG. It's just more for like getting in touch with people. So if you have any suggestions or whatever, like, please don't feel shy. It's a very small group. Uh, if you just pop on there and just suggest like, any format changes, suggestions, things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm going to say um, thanks to Michael Joker, who is hosting us today, I think for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks for your help. Um, and also to Eric, who's been uh, organizing a lot of the, um, uh, doing a lot of behind the scenes organizing. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to get it, getting the, um, the, uh, the talks together. And of course, thanks to our speakers as well, because uh, we couldn't do it without you. So you think I should wrap up, Lynn? Oh, uh, let me wrap up. Oh, well, thanks for the honor. Uh, so um, I wish all of you like a very good uh, end of uh, 2020. Uh, I hope 2021 might be slightly better <laughs> in terms of everything. Uh, it's been a very interesting year and I'm glad that everything is still going. Um, so we'll see you guys next year, probably Jen or Sam. Uh, if you have anything that, that you work over the holidays, I mean, it seems like most of us are not going anywhere. Can't be, go yeah, exactly. 2021 can't be worse. But let's not jinx it. Uh, so I guess everyone might be working on working on pet projects or doing anything. Uh, please feel free to just suggest the uh, talks in uh, GitHub. Uh, again, we are a community driven thing, it's been going on for many years, and it's all because of speakers uh, who are interested in what they're doing. Uh, so yeah, and so uh, yeah, exactly. I agree. We're very lucky to be in Singapore. Uh, so we hope like maybe physical meetups might be possible next year. That'd be really really nice to see everyone again uh, and to get back to like chatting and suppers and you know, just a bit of uh, face to face chit chatting since you're on the computer all the time now. Anyways, uh, so yeah. Again, if you want to help out or if you have any suggestions or anything, please feel free to just pop into our Telegram group which is t.me slash singaporejs. Uh, yeah. And that's it for this year. Okay. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, thanks, end of year. thanks. thanks Bye. everyone, for coming. And thanks to today's speakers. Yeah, thanks a lot. Happy Christmas. Good, good. Yeah, and happy holidays. All the gluttony that I'm planning. Happy New Year when it comes. Yeah, okay. There's like uh, Christmas, there's uh, New Year's, there's Chinese New Year's. Okay, I'm going to head out. Bye.